Welcome back to the Cube's here studio in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube, here with Dave Vellante, my co-host. We're here for the Silicon Valley AI infrastructure leaders here as part of the, the Cube and NYC's Wired program. I mean, he's here back on the Cube with Arm CMO. Good to see you. Thanks. Good to see you. Thanks guys for coming on. So we last time you were on the Cube, you were at Nvidia doing VP engineering for for, for the developers. Obviously, the success there has been great. Now it's CMO at Arm. Great to see you. Back in the action center is still the semiconductor boom has been great. A lot of our earlier guests, like were a lot of startups, 10 years ago, funding was very tight. Right. Now all the systems are being redesigned. Just a resurgence of infrastructure, action, you know, systems, hardware, chips, what's around the chips. Right. And a complete reset of what a data center looks like. Yeah. And the on-premise, yeah. you guys are in the middle of it, of course. Yeah. Everyone wants low power, high performance. Right. You guys in the middle of it. What's your what's your view right now at Arm? Yeah, you know, I, I was actually thinking about this earlier. I was uh, reflecting five years ago. I think I've been in the semiconductor space for about five years, so so not too long. But I remember five years ago when I joined, when I was at Nvidia, no one really even knew what Nvidia was. No one really knew about the semiconductor space. It was sort of sleepy, you know, humming mm -hmm. along. Yeah. And you look at the ChatGPT moment of what 2022, like we were talking about earlier. It's completely changed semiconductors, it's completely changed the world. It's completely changed yeah. what compute means and performance means. And so, you know, I've been at ARM for about eight months and uh, I sort of look at the amount of progress we've mm -hmm. made, but so much more to do. If you look at AGI and the promise of AGI and the computing needs, the power efficiency needs. In fact, if you look at, you know, Llama, which, you know, a lot of folks are using Llama to train, train their own um, specific models. Those are being trained on chips that were shipped a couple years ago because no one knew about Llama, right? Or, or, or any of these generative AI models. So we have so much more work to do mm -hmm. on the semiconductor space and where we want it to go with, with artificial intelligence. And so that's really what- When you, when you looked at ARM, when you came over, obviously they were already kind of on the upward slope and, 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 and continually, they've become the standard. And Dave has data, we'll go into great detail on that shortly. Where's the opportunity? Where do you see the continuation of ARM's value proposition. Yeah, so if you look at ARM, we're pretty much the compute platform for everyone. You look, we have about 70% of the world on devices that are on ARM, whether that's a smartphone that all of us use every day to advance servers that are running artificial intelligence. So everything now is shifting to high performance, yeah. low power, like you mentioned before. And that's really the opportunity in front of us at ARM. And that's what we really believe is we want to be sort of the platform and for ubiquitous computing for everyone. I look at ARM, kind of the early days when you took the chance and, and tied up with Apple, it was phenomenal. And then the volume started to kick in and then it became pretty obvious to us anyway that the new model for semiconductors, the fabulous model, but not only that, just the way in which you were able to reduce the time to tape out, for example, from years right. to maybe let's say 18, maybe even 24 months or less, Yeah. right? and then we started to see the XP, the, the emergence of the XPU. And yeah. it became very obvious that, wow, at these volumes, at these economics, at this power you know, profile, ARM is going to enter the enterprise. It was yeah. very, very clear to us. People said, oh, you're crazy. It's going to take a long, long time. And that, that's happened. And then, like you say, the, the GPT heard around the world. Right. Um, and so that's kind of the next phase. Yeah. Right? So you've sort of solidified the business model. Everybody's using ARM. You have to, and, and um, so what's next? How do you think about this third phase? Yeah, yeah, so I think, you know, as I mentioned, artificial intelligence is going to shape a whole new wave of computing, a whole new way of how, we, how you think about systems. Everything, to me, I'm an AI optimist by nature, and so I think the world of computing is going to be shaped by AI, and I think ARM's going to be at the, kind of the heart of, of all of that designing systems. And so, you know, we're looking at how do you make uh, AI democratized on the CPU. And that's really where ARM comes in, is how do you run AI workloads on the CPU in a more performant manner, in a more efficient manner than you ever were before. Yeah, you say you're an AI optimist, I, I like that, because <laughs> so often in, in tech, we, you know, especially lately, it's all about the negative. But there, you know, there, there isn't a, a major technology, electricity, you know, the steam engine, the internet, we don't want to give those things up. And I think the same is going to be true with AI. So when you think about AI optimism, why are you an optimist? What do you think this world is going to, this AI world is going to bring us? 
Yeah, I think advancements and everything, we haven't even seen the amount of use cases that AI is going to touch. I mean, we talk about healthcare, we talk about education, we talk about manufacturing. And we, you know, in our daily lives, at least in my daily life, I use ChatGPT as now my search engine or pick your favorite GPT engine. Uh, and I think we're just on the brink of what, there, what is yet to come in terms of how AI will shape all these industries. So I think it's going to be so pervasive across every single industry. It's going to be kind of table stakes. And generative AI is new, but AI is not new. I mean, we've been using AI for decades. But Gen AI makes us smarter. Yeah. Right. And it, it, right. it puts us. It puts it in our hands. No, we don't want to give that up. We're not right. going to want to give that up. <laughs> right. Well, it's all about efficiency. So okay. you're not giving up anything. It's how do you make your life more efficient? Well, everyone knows they watch the cube. I am beyond an optimist on AI. I love yeah. AI. I'm, I'm been drinking the Kool Aid. We've been drink, we're drunk on AI here at the cube. <laughs> uh, but oh I want you going. Way I, back. I want to go back because oh. I, like, I like to brag. I like to brag a lot when, when 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 we're that old. The cube's been around for 15 years, so we've done a lot of talking and pontification, but also forecasting. Uh, the Wikibon, now the Cube Research, has been right many times, but this is going back to October 2013. The Cube Research said, this is the date that mobile computing completely replaced the post-PC era and ushers in the mobile cloud era. The 64-bit ARM has been successfully launched and is now in volume production. Yeah. Okay, so PC era, mobile era replaces it. Now we're, and, and cloud was stuck on the end because cloud was in surge and we had to pick that separate, separate prediction, uh, which we got right. But now the same thing's happening. It's the post SaaS era right. is coming to the right. now gen AI era or intelligent app era. Right. That means that the processors, the, the chips, the systems, yeah. which we've been reporting, are not just servers, they're clustered systems. It's a, right. it's a data center is now a server and a collection of data centers now is a huge supercomputer. Right. That's what right. the reality is. Right. So IT is not going to be rack and stack. It's right. what's, how many supercomputer clusters do you have? Right, yeah, it's a new way to think about your data center from the chip to the systems, to the interconnect and the networking, all of that stuff is sort of the way you think about your data. I mean, we fundamentally changed the way that most people think about their data centers from chips to now systems. And the way you've done inside with security. I mean, you guys are right. really uh, you know, leading uh, that charge and a lot of folks followed suit. Yeah. Um, just the, the the other thing, the amazing thing, and a lot of people don't realize this, is if you talk about Moore's Law all the time, yeah. it's been amazing, it drew, drove amazing innovations, but if you just look at what, our, what Apple has done with ARM, right. and even A-series, the M-series, if, if Moore's Law is, you know, let's say, let's be generous, 40% a year improvement, yep. we're talking about 100 plus percent a year per performance right. improvement, right. which is just phenomenal. And, and actually that curve is bending up, isn't it? It's right. even getting steeper. Right. Right. So just you know, draw the curves and that's why I think all three of us are right. optimists. Right, <laughs> and performance. So perform, I mean, it's not only about high performance, but it's also about, about low power. Energy, yeah. Right, yeah, which, so, yeah. which has been you know, something that I don't think people really think about mm. as much as, as we should be. Performance using. per watt. It's right. interesting, a lot of the stars we had here on this inaugural event, a lot of stuff around energy in the chips and then also subsystems around it, um, which brings up the question you mentioned 70% of the market. How are you guys going to be competitive? How does, what's the competitive strategy, I should say? Obviously, you've got a leading product, you're in the lead. Right. What's the plan? How do you guys stay competitive? You're building a bigger moat? Is it software? Yeah. Is it new markets? What is the yeah. moves? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple different things. One is ecosystem. So we believe in the power of the ecosystem. In fact, if you look at, we have 20 million developers as part of our ecosystem. And to put that in perspective, CUDA has about 4 million. So software is definitely the flywheel for ARM-based hardware. As people start migrating their workloads to ARM-based software, that automatically creates natural pull for hardware. So, but for us, it's really about cultivating that ecosystem. We're highly dependent on our partners and our customers yeah. to really develop on ARM. But we believe that we're one, going to be one of the most pervasive, if not already the most pervasive. So your strategy platform. is to continue to keep the lead extended right. with, at, with the ecosystem scale and, right. and number of people. Okay, so the next question is, what are the most exciting technology things you guys are doing at ARM right now? Can you share yeah. uh, some of the happenings happening in, in the tech area for you guys? Yeah, you know, I talked about democratizing AI on the CPU. A lot of people think about training these large language models and that's why you need a custom AI accelerator, which of course is needed. But how do you actually take the, you know, only few people can take these large training models and, and train them with the capacity that you need for compute. 
But when you talk about practical use cases, you need, you need a way to run those. So we're, we're really thinking about how do you democratize AI on the CPU? And we have a number of capabilities that we now have as part of our technology that makes our CPU a lot more performant to run AI workloads. We call these matrix extensions. And essentially you're able to do vector math and those sorts of things on the CPU that you were never, never able to do before at mm -hmm. almost the same token rate as you can on other accelerators. I think so that's important. I, that's why I'm really excited. Well, that, what that brings in is, the, is everyone's moving to neural networks on all right. their data. With, we see the vector indexes are getting bigger. Right. Token context windows are super important. Right. Performance is critical. Right. And this is like getting down in the weeds. This is the future. Right. This is replacing the SaaS era. That's why I like this model because generative is a new category. And, right. And those matrix workloads, they require heterogeneous compute. Right. So you need to have that flexibility. And then to your point, you're now building these new intelligent data apps. Right. Which are going to make SaaS yeah. look kind of you know, anemic. Yeah, yeah again, post PC era is mobile, ushers in mobile and cloud. Right. Now, Gen AI right. er, ushers, well, goodbye SaaS. Well, SaaS gets consumed, but the people who don't go to Gen AI and SaaS fall away. Or right? SaaS transforms. You know, or transforms. You know. Right. I mean, if they're, if they're on the wrong side of the Gen AI wave, they're driftwood. Right, but, right. But what th we've seen these waves yeah. before. What happens is when you see these transitions, like the SaaS transition, yeah. they make a lot of money on SaaS with what is generally you know, seen as a somewhat outdated pricing model. That has to evolve into right. a new pricing model. And so you have these, these interesting transition times. Sometimes yeah. there's a little bit of a vacuum and then all of a sudden you hit the steep part of the S-curve and it's like, right. oh, hold on. Right, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think, you know, like all these inflection points in our, in our you know, multi-decades of being in technology, <laughs> there's going to be new industries created, old, and old industries die. And I think that's what you're going to see with generative AI. I think we're seeing that already is we're going to see new industries created and old, old industries go away. You mentioned earlier energy. I want to come back to that because that's a really big part of the focus, not yeah. just in every company, but in the design, you know, heat is generated, power comes in to power right. things, it generates heat, you got to yeah. cool it down. Right. This is a big part of the design for ARM. It's been one of the things you guys right. hang, hang your hat on. Right. How do you continue that forward? Because remember, more chips are being piled on each other around, there's yeah. more going on in, in the system. Yeah. What, yeah. what does the energy piece look like? Yeah, I think, well, so first of all, if you look at energy, why it's such a big problem, if you think about you know, doing a, a, a traditional web search to doing a chat GPT search, or a chat GPT query, or a GPT query, I should say, it requires three times, or even in some cases, 10 times the amount of energy. So that's going to just tax our power grid like we've never seen before. So I think energy has become so critical. I say, if we can't fix the electricity problem, you won't have AI. So no electricity, no AI. And uh, in terms of, you're right, you know, in our, our DNA has very much been around power efficiency. We talk about you know, the first batteries, early days of yeah. you know, running a phone and ARM was you know, at, the, at the core of that. And now you see that all the way to the advanced, most advanced server nodes, in which case you need a lot more power in order to generate AI. And what a lot of, I, a lot of these hyperscalers are doing is you need to be able to create vertically integrated systems and customize your, uh, your servers and your chips. And so ARM really gives you that customization and the flexibility to be able to put transistors in certain areas, to put things on the chip versus off the chip, all of which help with power efficiency. So we're taking our DNA, roots of DNA of power efficiency, all the way from the mobile devices that people are familiar with, with ARM, to you know, cloud-based servers. Yeah, and the nitro, we talk about nitro all right. the time, and graviton, that, that was another right. milestone that it sort of informed us that this is actually su such an obvious trend, and, yeah. and now it's just mainstream. Right, you know? exactly. And this, the hyperscales were early signs that that was going to come to the enterprise, but what ended up happening was with Gen AI, they, and the, the advance in, in the chip side is that they can actually deploy powerful clusters on premises, which is, you know, the whole, you know, no, no, one, no one builds data centers anymore, everyone goes to the cloud. Right. That was the old data center, but now those same footprints right. can be, be used to run essentially what was multiple supercomputers. Exactly. Like in some HPC yeah. specialized place. Right. Now the general enterprises can have supercomputers so now the workloads that are scoped right. could be managed. Right. There's not a lot of over-provisioning when you have an abundance of horsepower. Right. Now power, 
is energy, that's right. a whole other story. Because right. you got to feed the GPUs. Right. You got to feed the, the processors. Right, exactly. Or exactly. you got to run inferencing at the edge. Right. And you need really low power where you guys obviously yeah. are right. the, the dominant inference right. engine. Exactly, uh, on device AA, right. Yeah. Okay, so my question is okay, you mentioned ecosystem, because now, okay, you're going to have all kinds of inferences, you move it here. That's going to create an intelligent opportunity for software right. to manage either generative AI software or manage a new operating model yeah. to manage the new kind of hardware configuration and software configuration. Right. What, any vision there you can share around how you guys see developers yep. working on with ARM to get down at the kernel level yep. aspects yep. of efficiency? Because some of the best gen AI stuff are getting down to the machine level. Right, so. right. Yeah, and I, you know, I take a, I credit NVIDIA and I take a book, I, I take a page from my book in my past and now bringing it to ARM in terms of software and what, what, what I was able to do at software at NVIDIA and now bringing it to ARM. And so we're really thinking about full stack, not just the, the firmware and the drivers for the chips, yeah. which that's the place that we've always played in comfortably, but all the way up until the application stack. Like how do you actually fine tune and optimize all the way to the application stack? And what that means is, is that when we actually start shipping ARM-based devices, whether it's a mobile phone or a server, day one, the software is just optimized and works on ARM. So for us, the software is actually as important as the hardware itself because there's so much yeah. dependency in creating that vertically integrated system. So that's really what we're focused on from a, you know, specifics around that. We introduced something recently, kind of a couple months ago, it was called Clyde, and it's called Clyde AI. And essentially it's kernel level optimizations that integrate into the frameworks themselves, whether it's Llama or whether it's Gemini or, you know, pick your, pick your framework. And what we're able to do is leverage all of those CPU accelerations that I was talking about earlier, earlier the vector extensions, and all of that glueware just works. So we're working very, very closely with Google and Meta and some of these companies to make sure that they can utilize all of our CPU accelerations such that when a developer runs an application, like an Instagram, on you know, any CPU, it will actually take advantage of the, uh, the accelerations yeah. in the CPU because of that. You know, we had an earlier guest on that was talking about the, the skills gap at the kernel level. It's almost yeah. been kind of like asleep for a couple decades, but yeah. you know, that, that machine level demand for engineers to code. Yeah. So anyone watching, hey, you know, get, this is an opportunity. This is a big thing. Yep. This is going to be a big part. It's huge, that, that, that sort of standardization has always been in your ethos. And you can even take it down to the chip designer is writing to standards yep. when they you know, put, toss it over, if you will, to right. TSM. They know that it's going to get, it's going to work, it's going to have high yields really fast, and that's how it's compressed time to, to market, and right. to tape out. Right. It's interesting, right. full stack uh, developers was a term, and, and we, I called it half stack developer when the cloud came. And that didn't really resonate, it didn't really come across a half, yeah. you're a half a stack developer, <laughs> you're a half a developer. But now full stack systems designer, because what you're right. getting at is not so much a developer, it's a full stack system. Right. So right. it's different, it's not like I'm a full stack coder. No, 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 you're a system designer. That's right. the new revolution. Right, and I think developers, over time, I think if you look in the early days of you know, the, the 70s, in the early days of you know, compute, developers had to care about silicon. Mm. Slowly that silicon abstraction or the hardware abstraction has been really abstracted away, virtualization, other sort of programming logic. And now it goes full cycle. Now you actually have to, developers actually have to care about the system and the silicon in order to get the, higher, the, you know, the highest performance and the capacity and all the efficiency that you needed for, that is needed for generative AI. So it's sort of like, yeah. you know, the cycle of life goes full circle. <laughs> well, it's great to have you back on theCUBE and congratulations on your new up. role, picking the playbook that you've made successful at NVIDIA to ARM as they go to the next level too, everyone right. is. Final question, what motivates you these days? Obviously um, having a great time, you're in a sweet spot with, with the market and your yeah. talents. What's keeping you motivated these days? Yeah, I think it's all the exciting developments happening in the industry. Uh, you know, for me, I'm, a, I'm technically curious, as I like to call myself. So I'm always reading up on all the latest and greatest technology, learning and consuming. And, and more importantly, at ARM, just working on the world's hardest problems, solving that, you know, solving that with our partners. That's what keeps me excited. And there's a lot of papers to read these days. And there's not a, right. a second that goes by, there's a new AI paper. Right. And this new llama surpasses this, someone beats them over there. Right. It's like, a, it's watching F1 right. right now. It's like, who's going to have the next model? Exactly. I mean, thanks exactly. for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate thanks you taking your time. And, and know you're busy and appreciate you you're paying it forward with theCUBE. Yeah, thanks. no problem. All right, this is theCUBE, Palo Alto Studio for Silicon Valley AI Leaders. This is our, an 
inaugural event of the leaders in Silicon Valley around infrastructure, hardware, semiconductors, and software. This is theCUBE and NYC Wired together. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. We'll be right back.